good morning everybody welcome once again good to have you with me on this sunday morning and if you've been following along for the last few weeks you know that we are into a series that we are calling simply unlimited and we're exploring this unlimited lifestyle that jesus has for us to live and that the spirit of god is working uh, some very practical things out in our life that we can manifest it what i want to do for the next four or five weeks i want to take three or four different dimensions of this unlimited life and I want to explore them a little bit more thoroughly. Um, this morning I want to talk about the power source of the unlimited life. What it is that we can actually plug into that will enable us to walk into this life more fully. Then in the next couple of weeks I want to look at the perspective of the unlimited life. How we see and what is our view from, uh, from this unlimited life. Then I want to talk about imparting this unlimited life, not only from the Spirit to us, but from us to other people. And then finally, I want to look at the fourth, fourth uh, angle on this for right now, on the wisdom of the unlimited life. How this wisdom flows out of us. What does it look like? How does it, how does it uh, affect not only our life, but the lives of the people that we come in contact to? So we're going to look at some interesting dimensions. I hope you can stick with me. Uh, over the next few weeks as we follow through, and this will all be part of our Unlimited series. So this morning, I want to begin over in Mark chapter 11. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 9, a familiar uh, passage of scripture, a little story that Jesus told. I'm going to read out of the New King James this morning for this. I I'm going to jump back and forth between several versions of scripture this morning. So if I you see me reaching around, uh, I don't have my big pulpit like I used to have at the church, so I've got a table spread out here, <clears throat> so I'll have to reach for my different versions. But I, in studying this, what I want to say this morning, there are some versions that just say it a little more clearly than others. All of them are pretty accurate, but just some hit it in a way that I think really brings it to light. In this ninth chapter of Mark, I want to start in verse uh, 20. And it's, it's a little miracle that Jesus did, and he, he kind of uh, uh, works it in a way that he includes the person to come in in the miracle itself. Now watch what he says here. It says, and they brought to him, and when they saw him immediately, the spirit convulsed. Now if I, I uh, were to read the whole story, it's a man that brings his son to Jesus. And they brought him to Jesus, and when he saw Jesus, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell to the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And he said to the Father, now Jesus knows all things. Jesus knew the answer to this question before he ever asked it. But he asked the Father, how long has this been happening to this boy? <clears throat> and the Father said, from childhood. And the Father went on to say, he often has thrown himself into the fire, into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. That sounds like a lot of the prayers we pray, doesn't it? Jesus, if you have compassion on us, help us. We, need, we, we don't know what to do in this situation. And then Jesus answers in, that 20, in this 23rd verse, and he brings the man into this. <clears throat> and he says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. I want to just center up on that 23rd verse. I don't think he was putting pressure on the man. He wasn't, he wasn't putting condemnation on the man saying, well, doggone it, uh, daddy, if you had believed for your boy, you wouldn't have had to bring him to me. You know, your, your, your believer is, is inept. Uh, you need to get your believer in shape and you, you wouldn't have to be begging me to do this. He just makes a statement. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Now, I've talked to you about this word believing before because we have made it in religion. We have made it a word of works. And if you've been around the church world very long, you know that when we talk about believing, we're putting the onus on your back to work up some kind of uh, not emotion exactly, not mental assent exactly. We just really can't put a handle on it. But we've said, you know, you got to believe. Those that believe in Jesus, they're saved. And so we've kind of made this thing, but really that's not what believing is. Believing is a response to revelation. And when you see the revelation, when you see, then you believe. If you, and I think what, what, um, what Jesus is telling the Father is, watch and look, observe this. 
And if you, if you can see it, then you can believe for it so that you can begin to work this in your life. It's a response to revelation. When you, when you see the invisible, when you see the spirit, when you see what's going on behind the scenes, then you can believe it. But until you see it, you can't believe it. And I don't care who tells you they believe without revelation. They don't have a genuine belief. It's about this thick. It's about this deep. And when soon as something comes that pushes against that belief, if they haven't seen it, if they haven't got the revelation for themselves, they're going to give up on it. They're, they're going to move away from it. I mean, that's just the honest truth. So the unlimited life, the life that we're talking about in this series, uh, nothing is impossible with Jesus, right? So when we enter into this unlimited life, we know that nothing is impossible. This man believed that nothing was an impossible with Jesus, that Jesus could do something for his boy. And when we move into this life with Jesus, and I want you to stay with me this morning till the very end, if you have to leave, if you have to click off, come back and watch the rest because we, we're going to progressively build in this teaching this morning, all right? We know that nothing is impossible to Jesus. And when we come into this life of the unlimited, then we discover as we see more, as revelation gets stronger, we discover also that for us, all things are possible to him that believes. So let me just nail it down. Believing is not so much an act of our will as it is a simple response. It's, it's almost a reflex. There have been times that I have seen things, and as soon as I saw it, as soon as, as soon as the Spirit revealed it to me, I believed it. I saw it. Now, my mind didn't always grasp it, and my mind sometimes would say, no, that, that, you're off center there. But I knew, in, I knew in my knower, I knew down inside in my knower, I knew that I knew that I knew that what I had saw, I believed it. I, I, that, that's, there was truth there. There was something that was, uh, that was better than what I had ever anticipated. So believing isn't an act of our will. It's a response to revelation. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is that we shouldn't sweat believing. We shouldn't sweat faith. Those are two words that we have that are not uh, words of works, but we have turned them into works. And I'm telling you this morning as I get into this teaching that if we're going to live an unlimited life, we can't sweat believing and we can't sweat faith. Faith is a trust in the one who promised, right? So when we have faith, we're not putting faith in ourselves to be able to accomplish something. Our faith is a trust in the one who promised it. Faith comes from trusting the promiser, that he has the ability to do it. And, and believing is much the same way. When Jesus was saying, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes, I think what Jesus really, was really saying is, if you trust me, if you, if you believe that I can do this, then you know what? I can do it. But if you don't believe that I can do it, your part is to just acknowledge that I uh, am able. And because I am able, now I have pulled you into that circle by revelation. I've pulled you in there by your seeing that I can do it. I've pulled you into that dimension where also you can begin to do it. Let me just give you a simple illustration. I was reading the article the other day in the, in the local Houston paper, and it's not long before the Houston Astros go to spring training. And in the article that I was reading, they, the writer of the article, which was doing an inside report on the Houston Astros, our baseball team, for you that are from other countries, that's our baseball team here in Houston. They were promising that we would have a great season this year. Now, when I read the article, uh, I, I, I wasn't convinced. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of faith in that article. And the reason I didn't have faith in the article is because the Astros last year did not win the World Series. See, to me, a successful team is a team that's going to be in there and has a possibility of winning the World Series. Astros didn't win the World Series last year. Therefore, I didn't have a lot of trust in the article. I didn't have faith in the writer of the article. I didn't have uh, trust in the ability of the Astros to produce what they had promised. Therefore, my faith was not very high. My belief was not very high. I read it with, okay, we'll see what happens. That's not faith and belief. If I really had trust in what they were saying, I would have all of a sudden begin to believe, yeah, maybe we can do it this year. I'll bet you I have faith that we're able to accomplish that World Series, that we can get another World Series ring here in Houston. So, 
faith is really a trust in the promiser. The more trust you have in the promiser, the more faith you have. The more trust you have in the promiser, the more that you add uh, your focused attention to that which can take place. Now let's look at it from another different direction here. Let me, let me give you a scripture on that. Let's come over to Romans chapter 4 and let's read a little bit about old father Abraham for a minute. Acts chapter 4 and let's read uh, how he saw this. I'm going to read verses 1 to 5, then I'm going to read verses 16 to 21. It's going to highlight for you exactly what I'm telling you. Faith is trust in the promiser. Faith is having a belief that the one who promised it is able to deliver it. It's not, it's not trusting you. It's not having faith in you. It's not having belief in you. It's having a trust in the one that promised. So verse 1, chapter 4 of Romans. It says, And what shall we say that Abraham our father has according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. He put a trust in God, and that was counted to him for righteousness. Where does real righteousness come from? Real righteousness does not come from your actions. It comes from your trust in his actions. See, faith to be saved or, you know, get you to heaven, whatever we used to believe in the evangelical church, the faith didn't save you. What saved you was the trust in what he had done that was able to deliver you. Uh, verse four, now to him who works, or the one that is able to do it on his own, wages are not counted as grace, but a debt. Verse five, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Boy, there's a verse you'll never hear taught in church. He who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So how do I know that the ungodly will be justified? I believe that the one who said he would justify the ungodly has the ability to do it, right? So let's come down to verse 16. Let's, cover, uh, let's go a little bit further with this. <clears throat> Therefore it is by faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you, God said to Abraham, a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed who was God, who gives life to the dead. So he's believing in this God that gives life to the dead. His trust was in the one that is able to give life to the dead and who calls those things that be not as though they were. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed. What was, it, what was Abraham's belief in? He, he had a hope that God could do what God promised him. It wasn't a hope in his ability. His body, his body was past the age of childbearing. Sarah's age was past the age of childbearing. This man's, this man's up there. Verse 19, And not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body being dead, for he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. Watch. Was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now here's the verse. I read all that to say this. Here is what Abraham's entire faith swung on. Verse 21. Being fully convinced that what God had promised, God was able to perform. That's the faith of Abraham. Faith of Abraham had nothing to do with his body, Ab or Sarah's body, had nothing to do with any of that. He had, he had total trust in the one that promised it, that the one who promised was able to deliver. So let me just say it again. Faith comes from trust in the promiser. Just take the heat off yourself. Take the pressure off of you to, to get your believer strong enough to build up your faith. You know, we used to we used to say faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So what we would do is we'd confess scripture all day long to build up our faith. That's, that's not going to build your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing that the word God speaks to you. Because the word that he speaks to you, listen, this is good. Listen, the word that he speaks to you, you have trust in. And that trust is in the one who's able to perform the word that has been delivered to you. You can't just take scripture and confess it and say, I'm building my faith. That's not a word to you. You're just confessing words off a of paper. 
It's the word that he quickens to your heart. The word that he delivered to Abraham was the word that Abraham trusted in. So what I'm talking about this morning is, is strong stuff. The unlimited life is lived out of a trust in the Father's ability to do everything that he's promised to do for us. And he has placed all things in our hand. How many times have we read the verse from Peter that he's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness? So do I trust that that's a fact? Do I trust that that's true? If I do, then I have faith. Not in my ability to produce it, but in what he said he has given to me. Now, Jesus gives us the, the, the roadmap to get there. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, and I want to read this out of the Amplified, Jesus gives us the roadmap to get there. Now, don't leave me this morning. Please don't shut off and say, I, I, I've lost you already, because this is going to come into focus. We're going to get there. I'm just, I'm just putting down some foundation, trying to show you from the scripture. I'm not making this stuff up. Jesus said to him, I am the only way, All right? I am the only way and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, do you trust? Do you trust that? Do you trust that Jesus is the only way? I'm going to tell you something. If you're trusting Muhammad, if you're trusting Buddha, Confucius, I don't care who you're trusting in, it's not going to get you to where we're going. There's only one highway that leads to the life, that leads to truth, and that leads the way to the Father, and it's through Jesus, all right? It's, it's our trust in what Jesus has done that begins to open this dimension to the unlimited life. Now, what I'm talking about this morning, I've just, I've laid all this down. That's my introduction. Now, let me start to get into the message. <clears throat> what I'm talking about this morning is hitting that power source of the unlimited life. You know, that, that sweet spot on the bat. If you ever played baseball, you know that there's a spot on that bat that when you hit, when, when you connect with the ball on that sweet spot, it the ball travels farther than you ever imagined. On a golf club, if you you hit you you're able to drive that ball on the sweet spot of the club, it the, the ball just goes exactly like you want it. So what I'm talking about this morning is the sweet spot. I'm talking about that 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 place of the unlimited, the ascended, the elevated consciousness life, the higher dimension. I'm talking about being able to zone into that. Being able to zone into it. Now, Jesus is the way. We read that. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the only way to the Father. So we're, we're, let's agree this morning. Let's have trust. Let's have trust in that promise of Jesus, that he is the way. He is the truth. He's the way to the Father. Uh, everything evolves out of him. Now, if you, if you believe that, then I want to read you a verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 17. Verse 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. All right, are you ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now we're going to start moving, so, so fasten up. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 says this. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now if I'm, reading, I'm reading out of the New King James. It says it is one spirit with him. Now let me tell you something. The, with him is in italics. Now, if you've done any Bible study, you know that when you see the words that are in italics, it means that it was not in the original. So the way that it will read, and the King James actually says this, Young's literal, there are several versions that put it this way. They leave the with him off. And I think it's an important distinction. I, I think with him, there's still, there's still some tunis going on. It's you and him. But that's not what, what the verse is saying. It says, he is joined to the Lord is one spirit. There's only one spirit. It's not your spirit and Jesus' spirit somehow, somehow commingling. No, no. There's one spirit. And when you are joined to the Lord, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, where there had, might have been two, now you have been joined to the Lord. You were joined to him at his crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. You have been one spirit with him. See, with him, you're one spirit. There's one spirit. It's a, it's a merging of the two into one. So, Whenever we read Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, all right, now that spirit has been tied to your spirit that's going to move you in that direction as your consciousness becomes aware of it. All right? He's going to take you to that life. He's going to take you to that truth. He's going to take you to that place where all things are possible to him that believes. You are now one spirit with the source. Paul said it like this. 
Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. We've, there's one life. See, one life, one spirit. It's no longer I who live. There's one life. And that one life has one spirit. It's your spirit and his spirit has become one. Paul said it like this. He said, the faith that I live by is the faith of Christ. See, no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. There's one faith. It's not your faith and his faith. <clears throat> it's not you trying to develop your faith to match his faith. There's one life, one spirit, one faith. Now, this is incredibly important as we get into this. The Son's faith is in the covenant that he and the Father made together. And so that's where our faith rests. Jesus said, it's the Father that in me, he doeth the work. So it's the same with us. If we have one life, one spirit, all right? One life, one spirit, one faith, then our faith is in the covenant that we have made in Christ with the Father. Now, you don't get this wisdom on your own. You don't get this on your own strength. We're on a one-way street. We read it. Jesus said, I am the way. I am, I'm it. There's, you can't get on any other road and get to the destination you want to get at. If, you're, if you want to get into this unlimited life that I believe he's taking us into on an ever-increasing basis, then there's one street. There's one super highway to get on that will get you to your destination. See, the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. Holy Spirit, if you notice that, he never draws attention to himself. Jesus said, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he'll show you and speak of what I have done. He will show you what I, what I say. He will enlighten to you what I have brought and what, what I teach. Jesus always points to the Father. The Spirit always points to Jesus. The Holy Spirit will always highlight your being in full union, one spirit, one faith with Christ. So now when you, when you understand that, that you are one spirit with the Lord, when you are one, and you know, I'm quoting that wrong. We are just one spirit, not with him. We are one spirit, one spirit. There's one spirit. It's you and him as one spirit. As, as, as you begin to, to, to just recognize that that one spirit is, is also, you know, it is your spirit. It's the life you live out of. And I'm not talking just about resources. Forget, forget, the, forget the money and the gold and all that stuff. I mean, I think that's where a lot of us have taken. Okay, then I can tap in to um, the riches that Christ had or the riches of the Father. Okay, that's true, but it goes more than that. It, we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about knowledge. When, when Solomon was asked, when, when God told Solomon, Solomon, you can have anything that you want. You know, that's a, that's a wide open question. You know the one thing that Solomon wanted? Wisdom. You have access to his wisdom. Now, this is going to blow you away. Don't, don't leave me now. Don't leave me. Listen, this is going to blow you away. Remember Jesus said that he only said what the Father said. Do you remember that? I've talked to you. I've taught you that. He said, I only do the works that I see the Father do. All right. Jesus only said what he, what he heard the Father say. He only did what he saw the Father do. Now, let me ask you a question because this is important. Now, you remember one spirit, one faith, one life with Christ. Where did Jesus have access to what the Father said and what the Father did? Where, where did he get the inside information on the thoughts of the Father? Where, where would he learn to reflect the Father by seeing the Father. Where does, where does this happen at? Are you ready? <clears throat> Listen, this is good. This is good. The secret of gaining access to the power source of an unlimited life lies in the word secret. Lies in the word secret. There are two definitions for the word secret in the Hebrew. I want to, I want to, I'm going to, show these to you, but let me, let me just let me make it a little bit legal for you here. Proverbs chapter three, Proverbs chapter three. I'm going to give you two verses on this, but I just want to, I want to highlight for, uh, for you. Proverbs chapter three and verse 32. How many of you lick your finger when you turn your Bible pages? Verse 32, it says, for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. Watch. 
but his secret counsel, his secret counsel is with the upright. His secret counsel is with the upright. Now the Hebrew word for secret has, has two, two distinct meanings. One meaning is this. It means a secret or private counsel. It, it's used in context of like a family circle. Like if you called the family together and said, family, we need to talk about this. We need to make some family decisions. We need to make some family choices. We need to set some direction as a family. And so you called the family together in the living room and everybody sits down and you as the mom or the dad or whoever, however your family's arranged, you begin to lay out some things for the family. And you, you tell the children, children, I want you to know we're going to be changing cities. We're going to be moving cities. We're, uh, dad's changing jobs or, you know, whatever the situation is. And before anybody knows it, before we make this public, we want you, because you're family, we want you to be privy to this. All right? This has to do with our fellowship with Christ as one spirit. We can gain access. Jesus had access to the counsel of the Father and the Spirit. The three of them would sit down and they would begin to make the plan together. That's a secret. That's a, what the word in Hebrew is for secret. Now, because you're one spirit with the Lord, listen to me, this is good, this is good, listen. Because you're one spirit with the Lord, you can gain access. You have full access to the counsel of the family. That when the Father, the Son, and the Spirit sit down to counsel, you're included. They bring you in. They counsel in the temple. They counsel on the inside of you. Are, are you with me? It's, it's a closed deliberation. It's, it's a count. The, the root of the word for secret, it means to sit down together. So where, where did Jesus learn and hear what the Father said? It was in a secret council. Where did, he, did the Father show him what he was going to do? It was in the council of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was the setting down together of the three. Now, because the unlimited life is extended to you, they have brought you into the council of the family. Can you see that? They have brought you into the council of the family. And I'm going to show you in scripture, I'm going to show you, we never saw this. We never saw, I'm giving you, I'm telling you something this morning. I'm giving you the connector to the unlimited life. It's the council of the family that you've been invited to. The second, the second uh, uh, meaning of that word has to do with our safety. It's where as one spirit, we sit down and we are safely tucked away with them in this secret place. The secret of the private council, listen, listen. The secret of the private council with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit tucked away safely, that's the power source of the unlimited life. Now I'm going to read to you a verse out of the Passion Translation, Psalm chapter 25 and verse 14. Now I want you to listen to this because this, this is telling you exactly what I just told you, and we have never tapped in it. We have never seen our, our self uh, sitting down in the counsel of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have, we've waited for them to just give us instruction. We've just said, Father, you tell me what to do. It's kind of like people at the bottom of the mountain. Moses, go up to the mountain, find out what God wants us to do, and tell us, and we'll go do it. No, that's not the way it works. He wanted them to come to the top of the mountain and have counsel. He wanted to reason with them. Now listen to what this says. Psalm chapter 25 and verse 14, and this is out of the Passion Translation. There is a secret place reserved for the lovers of God. Did you get that? There is a private place or a secret. The New King James would say secret. There is a private place that is reserved for the lovers of God where they sit near him and receive the revelation secrets of the promise. You wanna know how you can be privy to the mind of the Father? The mind of Christ takes you into that, that place where it's a, a private place that's reserved. Are you a lover of God this morning? You say, well, I'm, I'm not very good at it. 
that don't have to be perfect. I just said, do you, are you a lover of God? Do you love the Father? Then he has the secret place where you sit near him. And when you sit near, that means you can hear. You sit near him and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. Do you know why we have not been able to uncover some of the secrets that God has for us? Why we've not been able to untwine some of this stuff? It's because we haven't been in that secret place where he said, I will reveal to you the secrets of the revelation. The promises that he gives to come in and set down and he will show you deep things. The things for life that before we had looked at and said, those are impossible. Listen, when he counsels you, it no longer becomes impossible. All things become possible. All right, let's go back. Let's go back to the New King James and let, let's read Psalm 91. Can we do that? Psalm chapter 91, because this, this gets into it. And it's a familiar psalm, so I, this is the one I picked to use. I could have used any number, but I wanted to use this one because Psalm 91 is, you know, is pretty familiar to most of us. And he gets, he gets after it in much the same way. Psalm chapter 91, let me read the first two verses. He who dwells in the secret place. Now, do you understand a little bit more about what the secret place is all about? You know, we, we, we've, we've said secret. We didn't know what it was. I'm telling you what it is. It's a place that's reserved for the lovers of God where he sits down in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and you, and he reveals to you the revelations of the deep things of life. We just read it. We just read it. He who dwells in the secret place of the, of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, the covering, the protection. See, that's... That's the protection. Both things are brought out here in this secret place. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He that sets in counsel. He that sets in communication as the Father, as the Father unveils deep secrets of revelation is under the protection. That's, that's part of what the secret place is. When, you, when you're there, you're protected. Not only are you hearing revelation, but you're protected. <clears throat> People that tap into the unlimited life in the inner sanctuary, make that a dwelling place. Our sanctuary, where the counsel of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit takes place, is within us. This is where you hear it. It's not going to come from some prophet telling you what the word of the Lord is. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, that's fine. I'm telling you, you are equipped. There's no prophet in the land that can tell you what you're not equipped to hear from yourself. Doggone it. We've put our trust in other people and they've jacked us around and messed us up. Thank God if they get it right. Thank God if they, you know, tell you you live at 19 Main Street and give you your birthday, fine. I want to sit with the Father and learn from Him myself the deep things, the revelations of life. It's a place where we listen. We don't do a lot of talking there. There's a whole lot you're going to bring to the table. But what we speak is what we hear the Father through the Son in the Spirit speak. We speak that also. And when we speak what we know they have spoken, guess what? It has power to it. It has dunamis. It has explosiveness to it. Over in John chapter 3, let me go over here for just a minute. John chapter 3 and verse, uh, let's pick it up at verse 34. John chapter 3 verse 34. It says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. If God sends you, you speak the words of God just like Jesus did. He whom God sent has spe speaks the word of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. He gives it an unlimited portion. You don't have a little bit of Holy Spirit. You don't have a junior Holy Spirit. When the Father gives the Spirit, it's unlimited. So you have the unlimited Spirit dwelling within you. So when we talk about this unlimited life, we're not talking about some out in la-la land, out where the uh, buffalo roam and the deer and the antelope play, something that's unattainable. He says, I have put an unlimited Spirit within you that enables you to speak the words that I speak to you. Verse 35, the Father loves the Son. Are you a son? Then he loves you. Are you, are you one spirit? With this son, yeah, then he loves you. Watch, for he has given all things into his hand. If you are one spirit with the Lord, that's why I read that verse earlier because I knew I was going to read this and I want to nail it for you. He's placed all things into the hands of the son. That's what verse 35 says, right? 
Now, if you're one spirit, if you and Jesus are one spirit, you and the Christ are one spirit, then guess what? He's placed all things into your hands because you're as much a son as Jesus is. That applies to those of us that are one spirit. This unlimited life has been opened wide to us. It's, it's absolutely open wide to those that have been awake to it. It's always been there. It has always been with us. We just haven't realized that Jesus tore the veil of separation. When Jesus died on the cross, you know, in man's consciousness, he had always kept the Father confined to this little place in the temple, this building called the Holy of Holies. And one time a year, the priests would go in there and meet and then come out and tell the people. Jesus tore that veil, and in tearing it, two things took place. Number one, it gave you full access to the Father. And number two, it freed the Father in the minds of people from being confined to that one little, one little space. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, let me read this one out of the Amplified. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. All right, I, I want you to, to see this because there's still separation in some people's mind on this stuff, but when you're one spirit, there can't be any separation. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Here's, here's the result of what Jesus did. Therefore, let us come with with privilege, approaching the throne of grace, that is the throne of God's gracious favor, with confidence and without fear, so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace to help in the time of need, an appropriate blessing coming just at the right moment. That's what the unlimited life taps into. At the right moment, we need the counsel of the Father. We sit down with him. We hear what they have to say, and we have full access to that. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get across to us. He's trying to say, look, you can come to the throne of grace. This grace flows. It's there. It's not confined to a little place where the high priest went back once a year into a secret place and then came out and told everybody what God was saying. Jesus made a living way, a new way for you to enter with him, as him, anytime, 24-7. It's not limited to one time a year. It's not limited to when you go to church. You know, going to church, you hope the presence of God shows up. People have been praying an hour before the service that God would be there, that his presence would be there. That's that's crazy. This That's so crazy contrary to what you understand why we haven't approached living an unlimited life because we have made all this so separated when the scripture says we're one spirit he is spirit our spirit now becomes one spirit we have full access to everything he has access to including his wisdom and knowledge and where do we get it we get it where jesus got it when we come into this secret place we sit down in family council and we read from, from the Psalms where the Father has this secret place for those that love him, where he shares intimately revelation. He shares truth, and he unfolds for you every mystery that you need to know. I'm telling you, we're tapping into some stuff that is mind-blowing. Don't you dare leave the digital cathedral. The weeks ahead, is, it, it's going to be astounding. It's going to be absolutely astounding. You don't, look, better yet, this secret place we're talking about, it can become your dwelling place, your place of habitation, where you never have to leave. Let me take it a step further. Let, let, let me just go one, one, one step deeper. You are never out of the secret place. You are never out of that place of counsel with the Father, except in your consciousness. Sometimes in our consciousness, in our minds, we get pulled off in all kinds of different directions. You know, you get, all, you get all emotionally distraught watching the impeachment hearings or whatever's going on in Washington or your local city. And that, that in your consciousness, then all of a sudden you leave that place of counsel with the Father where he will tell you exactly how to deal with that situation. Tell you the answer to the problem you've been looking for. All of a sudden you don't feel like you're connected. You never leave the secret place. When Jesus tore the veil, made access, it's not once a week, not once a year, it's a place you can dwell, but I took it further than that. You're never out of it. You are fully in it at all times. The secret place is a place of union. It's a place of communion. It's a place of presence. It's a place where you are privy 
to the plans and the conversation, man, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are privy to those conversations. Are you hearing me this morning? Man, I wish I was it. I wish I was it back in the church where I could just run around. I got I'm feeling this so strong this morning. And I'm trying to convey it to you that are around the world, how he's connected us by the Spirit. And if you can see that, then you know that together we come into that secret place and he can affect change around the entire world just through those of us that are connected here at the Digital Cathedral. A secret in Scripture has two meanings, counsel and protection. It's the power source of the unlimited life. It moves us into that dimension Oh my, are you ready for this? What I'm talking about to you this morning moves us into that dimension where you're going to live forever. You're gonna forever be in, in that secret place, privy to the conversations of running the cosmos. Just what we're doing here this little bit, this is just a training ground, man. The kingdom coming in to earth, this is a training ground for us. We're going to set in council with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the cosmos is ever expanding. If you know anything about science, they say that it's expanding at the speed of light. There are worlds, there are galaxies, there are things we have no clue about that in this secret council he's going to make known to us. It's the kingdom of God. First of all, the kingdom of God coming to earth, it's bringing heaven to earth heaven into this earth, right? The two meet in us. Heaven and earth meet in us. The secret place is the safe place that becomes our source of empowerment. It's where we hook into life and security. Now I want to look at, I want to look at Psalm 91 because these first 16 verses of Psalm 91 tells us what awaits us. It tells us how we've been equipped and how we've been empowered to enter into that place of the unlimited. I, I, I think there's such a, a, a fine little veil right now that has separated us from this unlimited, and we're like knocking at the door. We're knocking at the door. And like Bum Phillips said, uh, back when the Oilers were, didn't win the, win the Super Bowl, he said, we knocked at the door this year, but next year we're gonna kick the doggone door in. He didn't say doggone, but he said, we're gonna kick the doggone door in. And I think up to this point, we've been knocking at the door, but I'm telling you, we're gonna kick the door in. The door's coming down. This is a life that continually, as the Spirit reveals, it cuts the ties, it cuts the bonds off of us, everything that has been holding us down, uh, holding us in our minds outside of this family council. I mean. When I, when I studied that this week and I meditate on it, I'll tell you what, I, I went out there so far, I, 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 can't, I, I just can't even fathom what goes on in this family council. I can't, I can't even begin to imagine what the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit talk about in planning out for the cosmos and the lives of people, everything that, that goes on. All right, so that, that first verse of Psalm 91, there's two key words, all right? Their dwell and abide. He that dwells in the secret place will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So what, what he's saying there is we're going to get in a fixed position. And we're not in it. We're not out. You're not up today, down tomorrow. It's not good today and bad tomorrow. Uh, we're not asking God anymore to come bless us. We're not asking God's presence to, to fill us or come meet us at the church building. We're, we're way beyond that. It's a lifestyle where you acknowledge the kingdom. And let me come back to what I said before. Faith is having trust in the one who promised in his ability to bring it to pass. So everything I'm talking about this morning revolves around, do you trust the one who is saying all this to us? The one that said to us, I'm going to bring you in and reveal, do you trust that he's able to do that? Because if you do, that's, that's what the faith is all about. <clears throat> it's, it's getting that kingdom first in emphasis. It, it's seeking the promise that he's given us that all these things will be added to us. <clears throat> Do you have trust in his promise to add all the things to you? And the only thing he does is say, see, he didn't say you have to be perfect at it. He didn't say you have to just get really good at seeking it. He just said, seek it. At whatever level you're at, 
seek it. I want to finish up with Psalm 91 this morning just for a couple minutes because this is a powerful go-to psalm that unveils the power of a life that is lived in union, that is lived in that secret place, that is lived um, in that communion, that family council that sits down together and maps and plans everything out. It's, it used to be the high priest entered one time a year, but Jesus took care of that. Remember, Jesus ripped a veil. I'll remind you again, he ripped a veil, released all of it so you can come in at any time. So Psalm, Psalm chapter 91, this first verse is very forward looking. It includes everybody. It says, he who dwells. It doesn't say just the Christians. It doesn't say just a select few. It, it throws it wide open. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So he's saying, look, this is open to everybody. Anybody who wants to come in can dwell here. Anybody that wants the secret conversations, they can have it. It's open to all of us. The one that remains in union. He that dwells in the secret place abides under the shadow. You stay there. See, that this now verse 2 becomes our confession. All right? Once we're there, then this becomes our confession. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. There's that trust thing. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, safety. See, the second part of the secret place is that it brings safety. I will say he is my refuge, my fortress, my God. I trust in him. And we're going to find out what we trust him for. And whatever you trust him for, you have faith for. See, faith springs out of trust. If you don't have trust, you can't have faith. Abraham, Abraham said that. Abraham counted the one who promised it faithful to deliver it. So the things we're going to read, and I'm going to read verses 3 to 16, and I want you to see what comes out of this unlimited life if you trust him. That's all he's asking. What, what, however you can trust him, whatever level you can trust that, just trust him. All right, now just follow along with me in this. Verse three, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, the perilous pestilence. He'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by day, by night, nor by the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. He's saying, man, you, you have entered a dimension of power. You're not afraid of COVID-19 or anything that comes into the earth. It doesn't affect you. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. See, this is what he said. If you dwell in the secret place, he gives you counsel. He gives you instruction how to live like this. And that's where you're dwelling today. Some of you are conscious of it. Some of you aren't conscious. But he wants to reveal to you the revelations. We read it from Psalms. Let me, let me just read that for you again. Psalm chapter 25 in verse 14, there's a private place reserved for the lovers of God where they sit near him and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. That's what he's telling us right here in Psalm 91. I get so excited about this. I can't hardly sit, I can't hardly sit here. This is such good stuff. Let's, let me just read on. Verse 8. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. You live there. You don't come out. You stay conscious of it. No evil will befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. That's some strong stuff. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot because he has set his love upon you. He has set his love upon you. Therefore, the conclusion is, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me. I'll answer. I'll be with him in trouble. He walks into the trouble with you. Yea, yo, you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You don't fear evil for he's with you. His rod and his staff, they comfort you. I'm with him in trouble. Every trouble you go to, he is there with you. Feeling the feelings, the hurt, the pain, the anxiety, uh, whatever it is. He's... He's not distant. He's in there with you. 
with long life I will satisfy him. How long is a long life? A long life is until you're satisfied. I think the end of life would be when you say, I'm happy, I'm satisfied, I got everything done, need to get done, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go to a higher level, I'm ready to go to a different consciousness. And I will show him my salvation or my fullness, my completeness. We've discovered the secret, man. We've discovered this, this, this power source that we can plug into, this unlimited ascended life. You know what the power source is? It's union in the secret place. It's living and dwelling there and not coming out, keeping your consciousness focused in that place and listening. You're not talking, you're not babbling along, you're listening to what he says. It's living his life as our life. Jesus said, the words I speak, Speak, they're the words the Father spoke. The actions I take, they're the actions of the Father. Where'd Jesus learn it? In the family council. Where can you learn the same things? In the family council. Ha, do you have right there? Yes, you, you and the Lord are one spirit. His life is your life. It's no longer you that are living. The life you're living, you're living by the faith of the Son of God. You have every right to walk into that family council. Listen, Mr. Businessman, you need answers to questions. I don't have the answers. You can message me, I can't tell you, but in the family council, that's where you get the answers. All your stress, your anxiety, you're pulling your hair out and, and sleepless nights, that's your fault. And I'm, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. That's your fault because you haven't taken advantage of the family council. And I'm telling you this morning how to do it. It happens within. You, you listen and they talk together. When he ascended, we ascended with him, we're seated with him in heavenly places. That's just another way of saying we've entered into that holy place and we're one together. See, we're seated with him. He's seated next to the Father. So where are we seated? We're seated in him next to the Father. We've plugged into it. And you can never be the same after the teaching this morning. You're going to have to do something with it. Either you're going to have to go back to your ways of fretting and stewing and hoping and praying and bawling and squalling and begging God, or you're going to have to come to a place where you say, I want to come in to the family council that takes place, and I hear the, I hear the wisdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, now next week, we're going to take this up another notch. I want to look at the perspective. I want to look at the point of view of the unlimited life that we have entered into, and you have entered into it. You're just on one level of consciousness waiting to ascend to a higher level until the fullness of Christ is formed totally within us by our awakening to it. We have been positioned perfectly to see everything with 2020 vision. I want to talk about that next week. Make sure you're with me. Same time, 10 a.m. Wednesday night, we'll pick this up a little bit. We'll clean up some of the scraps, maybe take it a little deeper. I talk to people on Wednesday night about things I don't talk about on Sunday morning because the general public comes Sunday morning, but but my peeps gather on Wednesday night on the Don Keithley ministry page. If you haven't joined, go over and join. 7 o'clock Central at Don Keithley Ministries page for Wednesday night. And I'm looking to rename Wednesday night. If you've got a good name for Wednesday night, message me or uh, make a comment somewhere where I can see. I'm looking for a new name for Wednesday. I have called it Wednesday Night Live, but that's so doggone generic. It almost has a religious ring to it. So I'm looking for some, some other name to call it. All right, let's keep exploring together. Can we do that? Let, let's hold together. He, God has brought us together. He's formed us together, knit us together. We're making the journey together. And I'll tell you what, I'm having a ball. I don't know about you. This is the most fun I've had in my entire life. I am enjoying this phase. And it's going to get gooder and gooder and better and better as we continue the travel together. Thank you for your help, your love, your support, your prayers. See you next Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Central here at the Digital Cathedral.